Thanks everybody for coming this morning. Welcome to the Wallace Collection. I'm uh, Toby Capwell. I'm the curator of Arms and Armor here, um, responsible for what is essentially probably in numeric terms about 44% of the entire contents of the building. Uh, what we're going to be seeing today is without question one of the greatest collections of arms and armor in the world. I've been here for 12 years and I still see new things every day. We think that works of art and tools are two different things. And works of art should just sit on the wall and function only for the expressive message and intent of the artist. This is a modern way of thinking. But to really understand these objects in the medieval period and the Renaissance, it doesn't exist. These are, of course, decorative works of art, but they also have huge expressive power. This collection is also really remarkable from a collecting point of view because it's essentially the accomplishment of one man, Sir Richard Wallace. So isn't it extraordinary that one of the greatest collections of arms and armor in the world, right up there with the big museums, is actually the achievement of one collector. It's very easy in 500 or more years for the individual elements of an original armor as worn to get separated. And the vast majority of the armors that you will see on the market and indeed in museums are what you might call composite. They were put together in the 19th century usually, but often it still happens in the 20th and 21st century. They are put together from different parts that don't belong together. And it's extraordinary because being early in the 16th century, uh, it's still relatively undecorated. The 16th century was the great age of armor decoration. But this one is hugely important because it's a very fine quality, made for a member of a royal court. And yet, apart from some subtle etching, it's entirely undecorated. But its artistic power and presence still comes through. It is essentially a hollow sculpture that is designed to contain and augment and protect the body of the artist's patron. Um, in, in a way, armor is a process, profound process, through which the artist transforms the patron himself into a living artwork. If you look at how armors, the great courtly armors of the Renaissance self-identified, they thought of themselves as artists first and engineers second. Uh, and often you see functional sacrifices made on an armor for the sake of it looking even more splendid, even more like a living artwork. How long would it take to make it all? Uh, yes, that's a good question. I mean, armors could take uh, gr hugely varying amounts of time to produce. Uh, sometimes it's six months or more for a nice armor, uh, and armorers are, are, are notoriously uh, difficult to keep to schedules. Um, but, uh, but it's clear also that they could be made very quickly. In the 15th century, there are contracts signed by armorers in Milan undertaking to make a complete armor every day. One, one complete armor per day. Now that's a consortium of craftsmen working very effectively together, but um, but when, when the Emperor Maximilian needs an armor, he gets one. In so many ways, armor, uh, its, its place in the society is very much analogous to cars now. And we can see how cars stylistically evolve decade by decade. And they evolve for technological reasons because airflow is more efficient this way or that way, uh, or uh, because of the function of the particular car, or just because of technology is advancing. But there is also an artistic sculptural level to the design of automobiles. We express ourselves through the inanimate objects around us. We project our identity onto inanimate objects around us. What were they trying to express with an yeah. armor, I guess? Because you were saying that the body aesthetics quite, changed quite a bit. Yes, well this is a great example of that. Uh, this is an armor made at the court of Elizabeth I. Uh, made in Elizabeth's court armory at Greenwich, just across the river. Uh, and this is a war armor. It's, it was probably originally made in preparation for the Armada invasion in 1588. It was probably in, in the, the armorer's workshop the previous year, when there was a lot of preparation for the invasion. Uh, and this was made for Sir Thomas Sackville, Lord Buckhurst, who is a very close uh, supporter and courtier, diplomat, and author in uh, Elizabeth's court. 
but he was also a military commander and he was responsible for commanding cavalry defending the south coast. And this is a war armor that was probably made for him to serve in that role. But beyond the fact that this is bullet, a bulletproof armor designed for fighting on foot and on horseback and everything else, this is also a wonderful expression of what the Elizabethans thought the ideal male body should look like. And it's the exact same silhouette that you will see in any full-length Elizabethan portrait. And their body aesthetic also summarizes their attitude to masculinity in general. In that, it has a very powerfully built muscular upper body and thin little graceful legs. And that sums up the duality of being a nobleman in the 16th century. You need to be a knight, you need to be a warrior, you are a trained killer who has been a martial artist since they were five years old probably, but you are also an esthete. You also are a dancer. You also have an elegance and a fineness in uh, your intellectual and spiritual life. How much would worth this armor in comparison to an old master painting? Uh, well, this armor cost around 500 pounds. And then he had to spend another 250 pounds on the royal license that would allow him to go to the royal workshop and have an armor made in the first place. So 750 pounds to an Elizabethan nobleman uh, is still probably uh, several times his annual income. And typically one armor would last a lifetime, I'm guessing. Oh, no, 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 no. The armors like this were usually, the high-end high ones were worn once. They were made for a specific event, a specific tournament, a parade, or a military campaign. And armor is evolving so fast, you can't, you can't wear an armor that's five years old right. because the style is different. Right. And you'll very rapidly look like you're wearing your grandfather's clothes. <laughs> and you can't have that. Um, just quickly, before we move on, also this armor is very interesting, uh, just technically, um, because it looks like a German armor in the Maximilian style. A style developed in the early 16th century at the court of the Emperor Maximilian, hence the name. Uh, but this is not actually a real Maximilian armor at all. This was actually made in the 17th century. And I think this is an interesting armor because it shows that armors, like artists working in other media, were aware of their history, they were aware of the artists, the, the, the work of artists of previous generations, and they were inspired by and referring back to them. That is a real one. Uh, and if you compare the two, uh, you can start to see how although they superficially look similar, in the fine detail, the way the flutes are created, the way the, the, the metal has been sculpted, they are actually quite different. This is a later imitation of this style. As well as a great collection of arms and armor, um, the Wallace works very hard to maintain uh, one of the world's great study archives for the subject of arms and armor. Um, for many years we've collected uh, the books and the uh, papers and uh, written evidence for, for our subject. And um, because the early connoisseur collectors of arms and armor were often authors themselves laying down the foundation literature, there's a fascinating relationship between you know, what's upstairs and, and what's down here. Uh, and one thing I thought would be really interesting to look at is the three volume history of armor that was written by Sir Samuel Rush Merrick in the early 19th century. This is the first scholarly work on the history of armor. This is the first time there's a chronology that tells you there is a stylistic development in armor from the 10th century to the 18th century. And if you go through the plates as we go around, you can see in the, the, the charming uh, illustrations how armor, generation by generation, decade by decade, evolves. And uh, you'll notice here on this one, um, the very armor that you just looked at in the previous room. This is the same mannerist armor used as, a, as an illustration in the, in the text. We looked at the, the beautifully preserved homogeneous early 16th century armor earlier where all the parts um, belong together and are preserved essentially in the way the armor was originally worn. Uh, and this armor is a fabulous example of the polar opposite. Uh, this looks like a complete armor, um, but the more you look at it, the more you might think there's something vaguely strange about this. Uh, 
your, your basic human senses might tell you this doesn't look very much like an actual human being. Um, and that's because it, the entire thing has been put together in the mid-19th century. What we have here is a wonderful example that you can really follow in some detail, the story, um, of, a, of a dealer, we don't know who it was, but it was almost certainly in Paris, who had some good fragments. He had a good lawsuit helmet and matching pair of gauntlets that were missing their thumbs. Separately, he had an extremely fine Augsburg breastplate. And he had some other disparate elements, shoulders, a left elbow, bits of some legs, made in North Germany uh, later in the, in the 16th century. And he's looking at these pieces and thinking to himself, these are fine pieces, but I can't sell them. I can't sell a left elbow, a helmet, some gauntlets that are missing their thumbs, and some other random elements. What I need to do is build this into an armor that someone can set up in their drawing room. Then it will sell. So he's put this together. This is nothing like anything that would ever have been worn in the 16th century, even though it is composed of very, very fine quality pieces. Uh, it is, in fact, made up of pieces from five different armors made in at least three different places in, uh, in uh, uh, dates widely spread across the first half of the 16th century. I've opened the case so you can come in and have a look at this. Um, have, a, have a quick look at the, the etching. Pay attention also to the state of preservation. Some of it's in better condition than other pieces. And if this thing had all been together since the 16th century, the condition on all the pieces should be the same. So when you see radically different states of preservation, some pieces seem like they're heavily pitted and deeply oxidized and heavily re-cleaned, and other pieces don't, that's another warning sign. Uh, these are some replica pieces. They're modern made, but they are very good representations of certain real, uh, real types of armor, um, but showing you what the thing might have looked like when it was new. So very finely polished um, in this case and also having the, the padded linings and, and furnishings that you need to wear to wear the helmet. This is one of mine. Um, I've been, uh, this helmet was made for me in the late 90s. Um, and so it's a nice example of the longevity of armor. I've jousted in tournaments all over the world in competition in this helmet. Uh, it's been hit a lot with lances and swords and all kinds of things, but the, the quality of the, the carbon steel I think uh, testifies to itself. Then you've got another, uh, a, a pair of gauntlets. Um, so often, only the metal parts survive. Um, but armor usually has integral leather, textile elements that over time, organic elements degrade and fall out and don't survive. The, this this uh, uh, goat skin glove is stitched in just with linen stitching. If the stitching rots away, the glove falls out, and, the, and, and is lost. But this is a nice example of what a, a piece of armor is, is meant to look like when it's functional. We've picked these pieces too because they have, um, they're nice demonstrations of different decorative techniques. Uh, embossing and chasing, acid etching with some, with some recessing and a bit of embossing to, to refine the forms. And also this is a nice example of bluing and gilding and etching all put together on a, on a royal object. This one is much more heavy than that one. Yeah, but that's a clue. That this that is a fighting is... helmet and this isn't. Okay. If it's just for parade, you don't need it to be heavy. So the first test, will it work as armor? If it is claiming to be a helmet, then it has to work as a helmet. And if it doesn't agree with the proportions of a human face, or if it has some other basic functional problem, then you should have alarm bells going off. And the two mask visors here are, um, are examples of this. One of these is completely original and one is a fake. I think I heard some of you picking up on this already. Does someone want to categorically put their, uh, put their um, whatever to the mask, colors to the mask, sir? Yes? The one on the right is original. Yes? The one on the left is a fake. And why would you say that? Well, this has got all sorts of 
practical functional bits like yes. this sit at the top. Yes. And this one hasn't. And also yes. the one on the left is a lot heavier. Yes. So if you had it on the helmet, you'd yeah. be down this sort it's of It's heavier thing. than it yeah. needs to be, maybe. Yes. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Well, yes. Uh, you're, you basically nailed it. Uh, if you look at this one, uh, it's a mask visor. The good ones were portraits of the person inside, or sometimes they're more generic, grotesque faces. But these are still for fighting. We have these examples of these used in tournaments and on the battlefield. So, if it's going to cover your face, like the helmets you could put on over there, you need to be able to see out of it, right? And these little pierced holes in the eyes of the mask are not good enough. You need to have real helmet sights, just like these, just like these. Uh, and this has the pierced eyes, which are cosmetic. They're, the piercing might actually be much later, actually. It might not even be original to the object. But still, the thing comes down, and you can see out of here, not out of the eyes.